Okay, um, we're going to talk about more rotation today, and the idea will be this. Really, we're going to review a lot of concepts we've already covered, and then almost just slap a radius onto the equation and talk about how radius is now involved because it's spinning. Okay? Now, um, with that in mind, do not copy down everything you see on this board. Because a lot of times I'm going to review something. I'm going to remind you. You want to look for things in bold, especially early on. Do not copy down every word you see because I'm not going to give you time to copy down every word you see. Okay? I want to remind you of something we learned. We're basically going to go through all the stuff we've learned before. Inertia, momentum, force. But we're going to say now when it's rotating, it's going to be this. Okay? So, first up is inertia. So again, don't copy this down, but let's review. Inertia, first thing about inertia, remember, was that if objects are moving, they keep moving. Right? We're out in space, we throw a baseball, it's going to keep going with the same velocity and direction forever. Remember that part? Yeah? Okay. Well, so objects in motion stay in motion. The same idea will be now applied to rotational inertia. If you get something spinning out in space, it will keep spinning forever. Like the Earth. Look at that. Yes. Just like the planets. Um, you know, you see people, it, sometimes if NASA wants to get a satellite spinning, it's going to keep spinning. They just got to get it spinning at one point, it'll stay spinning. Okay, so objects that are spinning, objects rotating, will want to stay rotating forever. Okay, so that's in bold. You can copy that down. Now, the second part of inertia was this. <clears throat> the more mass you had, the more inertia, right? So, if you have a, it, it's going to be harder to start and stop a Mack truck than it is to start and stop you on your bike, right? Because there's more mass, the Mack truck has more inertia, it's going to be harder to get going or to stop. Well, that can be still applied with rotational inertia. Okay, so that was the old stuff. The greater the mass, the greater the inertia. And that still applies. So, if I'm doing this, it's not that hard to start and stop. If I add mass, it's a little bit harder to start and stop. So that part still applies. However, remember how we said we just slap a radius onto what we're covering already? That applies here. So, rotational inertia is, is similar. The more mass we have, the more inertia. But also on top of that, the further the mass is from the axis of rotation. So, if I have, so this is easy, okay? This is harder, but this would be the hardest. If I push the mass outward, there's a lot more rotational inertia here than there is here. Okay, so the, as the mass moves further away from the axis of rotation, you have more rotational inertia. And that can be very useful. Okay, we'll pause there and let you copy. Hmm? Action! Here are some uses for uh, rotational inertia. A bike. Okay, the reason that Bicycle wheels will have spokes. Well, I'm guessing there's a lot of reasons, but one reason and one helpfulness of, uh, of that is the more the mass is pushed to the outside, the more rotational inertia. Okay, so if we have a bike wheel, and obviously we, you know, with bikes, you don't want it to be heavy. You want it to be light. If you're going to go up a hill, you don't want to have to pull up this heavy bike. But if you're going to have mass, you want that mass pushed to the outside on the wheels. Um, if you have this wheel, and let's say you had a, a, a wheel of the same mass, but it was a solid disc. Does that make sense? So instead of having all the weight pushed out, all the mass pushed out, you had a solid disc. If you spun the two at the same time, the solid disc would always stop before this. The friction would get to that solid disc before this one would. Okay. Because the mass is pushed to the outside, this has more inertia, more rotational inertia, which means as you're coasting along, you'll be able to coast a much further distance with this type of wheel 
than something that is a solid disc. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So rotational inertia, pushing the mass to the outside, can be a helpful thing. Um, most people don't know what an aerobie is, but it's a frisbee that's really more like a ring. Um, yeah. I see a lot of blank stairs, but the idea is <laughs> instead of a frisbee disc, they have these things called aerobies that are just the ring, just the outer ring of it. And those will have much more inertia, okay? It's lighter, but it has much more inertia and will have a better spin to it as it flies through the air compared to a regular frisbee disc, okay? And so that's another reason to get, get a good spin going. And spin is obviously important with Frisbees because that helps with also with lift. Not that we're going to talk about that now. But the better you have the spin, the more spin you can have to it, the better lift you'll have. Okay. Golf clubs. Same idea with golf. If I'm going to have a rotation, right? Here's my rotation. If I'm going to have rotation, I want to push all the mass to the outside. So a uh, more expensive golf club will have a graphite shaft to it. Instead of aluminum, they use graphite. And graphite has a little bit of springiness to it too, which I'm sure helps. But the other idea is that when you have that rotation, if you can push all the mass to the outside on your drive, that means you have much more rotational inertia. So if a ball happens to get in the way, you're going to hit that ball much farther distance. Okay, so rotational inertia, pushing to the mass to the outside when something spins, can really have an effect on things. Okay? Okay. All right, now, I don't want you to copy down everything you see here. I do want you to understand what we have right here with right-hand rule. Okay? Right-hand rule is this. When we talk about angular momentum, if I was running in a straight line, you have a fullback full running in this direction. Which direction is his momentum going? If I'm running, if my velocity is in that direction, which direction is my momentum? The same way, right? Yeah. Same way, okay? Well, which direction is momentum pointing now? This has momentum, has rotational or angular momentum. Is it going to work? It actually is going to be, you follow the right hand rule, because you could say, is it here, is it there, is it there? Velocity is going tangent. Tangent of the circle, remember tangential? Okay? But angular momentum follows the right hand rule. You use your right hand, you curl your fingers in the direction of the spin, and your thumb will point in the direction of the angular momentum. So right now, the angular momentum is pointing up. Okay? Now it's pointing down. Now it's pointing at you. So your thumb decides. Your thumb points, right hand rule, it's, it's actually a calculus thing. Um, which we won't get into, but um, if anyone is taking calculus, they also call that cross product, okay? But the idea is still, we'll follow the right hand rule. You curl your fingers in the direction of the spin, your thumb will point in the direction of angular momentum. Okay, I'll let you copy that down, and then we'll start talking about regular momentum to remember something about it. So we'll pause for station identification. Okay. But remember one thing about regular momentum. Actually, a couple of things. First, remember the direction was important with momentum, right? Um, but also, if one thing went down, another thing had to go up. Conservation of momentum. So if mass went down or velocity went down, then the other would have to go up. We had the carts that cl would collide. So we have one cart sitting here. The other cart would collide with it. The mass would double and the velocity was cut in half. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, that still is applied to angular momentum. If something's spinning, it'll have angular momentum. And still you have mass and velocity that will come into play. But on top of that, like I said before, we're gonna just slap a radius onto some of our old equations. So if angular momentum, we're gonna have the formula L equals MVR. So for angular momentum, L equals MVR, where L is now angular momentum. And that's equal to mass times velocity times radius. Hmm? Now again, if you had something where the mass went up, the velocity would go down. 
But more important than that and more useful than that is now if the radius goes down, the velocity will go up. Okay? Think about the figure skaters. Okay? When I was in the Olympics, okay, for my figure skating, I'd get my rotation. What do they do at the end, right? At the end of their routine, they get spinning and they start out all the way out here. They push all their mass out. Okay? This is Olympic form right here, just so you know. Okay? They get their rotation, they push all their weight out. And then once they start moving, they bring themselves in. And what happens? They get faster. Yeah, they speed up. They go much, much faster. Okay? The idea is this. They get their angular momentum. They get rotating here and have their angular momentum. They push their mass, their radius out as much as possible. Then when the radius goes down, when R goes down, V has to go up. Okay? So conservation of angular momentum. If one thing goes down, the other thing goes up. So that's why they speed up. They even like pull their arms in and do that. The faster, the more they can push all their mass inward, the faster they're going to go. Does that make sense? Okay, so the concept we need to know is that if the radius is decreased, the velocity is increased. And I will have my Vanna Come on down for our first demonstration. No, not yet. Wrestling's the last thing. Okay. What Vanna will do for me is first start out with your arms out like that. Okay. We're gonna get you going, and then you're gonna pull your pull your arms in. Okay? Nope, if you need to slow down, down or stop, if you need to slow down, just put your arms back out. Alright? Here we go. Ready? So, we get moving. Alright, go ahead and pull your arms in. Put your arms back out. Arms in. Arms out. Cool, huh? Okay, so the radius goes down, the velocity goes up. The radius goes up, the velocity goes down. Cool. Thank you, Vanna. Okay. We got that? We good? Okay, now. Other people can try if they'd like. Now. But you give me the harmful one, that's okay. That's cool. Huh? Listen, you give me the harmful one, that's cool. I can be the harmful one. Okay. Um, now, the other part of angular momentum is this. Remember we said right hand rule, there's a direction to it. If I was a fullback, regular momentum, I'm a fullback and I'm running in this direction. If I all of a sudden go in the opposite direction, that's going to take a lot of change in momentum. So if I'm going this direction, there has to be at least twice as much momentum to knock me to start going the opposite direction. Okay, do we have the same velocity? So direction was important with regular momentum. It's important with rotational momentum too, or angular momentum. So if I have something we said following right hand rule, angular momentum right now is pointing up. If I all of a sudden want to change the direction, it's going to fight against me. Direction is important. And momentum has to be conserved which means direction too. So if you get something spinning, okay, and then you try to change the direction, it's going to fight against you. Okay, which is why I, I had you do that before, where we have it not spinning, okay, it's really easy to move back and forth. I get it spinning, and it's gonna fight against me. Okay, this is what happened when they first started testing out helicopters. Because with a helicopter, they, they figured out what to do with a the helicopter, they got something moving, and they said, all right, we're gonna go forward. And when they went forward, it went to the right. And then they tried to pull back. And when they tried to pull back, I guess to the left, really. And when they pulled back, it would go to the right. So it, was, it would change direction. It would go the opposite direction that they actually wanted to. Okay, and again, that's calculus and cross product and all that stuff. Um, but they actually, so when they first tested helicopters, they had to realize pretty quickly that they had to point in the opposite direction they thought until they could work out the circuitry and all that. So it actually do what they wanted to. Okay? Alright, we'll pause there and I'm just gonna walk around and let you feel helicopter.
helicopters, the, the fact that if you try to go, if I try to go to the left, it's going to point up. If I try to go to the right, it's going to point down. Okay. Uh, that's at, also if you ever wanted to do a frisbee pass with or a bounce pass with a frisbee. People try if you've ever seen that. Maybe in the spring we'll try that out. If you want to do a bounce pass with a frisbee, you actually don't want to have the front tip hitting first. Because if you hit the front tip, it would go to the right and go away. So what people do is they do a bounce pass, they're actually going to throw it at an angle here. And if you have it go on the left side, it will bounce up. Okay, so if you've ever done a bounce pass or try to do if you like throwing a frisbee around, you'll actually throw and have the left side hit and then it'll bounce up. Okay? All right, now, so what I told you was this. With angular momentum, or when something's spinning and it has angular momentum, in direction is important. If it ha the faster you spin it, the more angular momentum, the more it's going to fight against you if you try to change the direction. All right, Vanna, come on down. Here we go. You're going to wrap this around your hand, and we're going to you're going to hold the uh, you're going to hold the bike uh, the wheel up for you. Just wrap this string around your hand. Oh God. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. All ready. Everybody watching? Yeah, yeah. What are we talking about? All ready. Get set. We're recording, right? Okay. Go. I'm just kidding, I didn't do anything yet. Oh, Here we go. <laughs> Ready, set, go. Oh, oh that's so cool. Okay. Let's try it. Because it's spinning, it has angular momentum and wants to keep pointing the same direction. And we talked about the bounce pass and all that. Because we ha he has to pull up a little bit, he's at applying a force, which makes it spin a little bit. But it wants to keep pointing in the same direction the whole time. Okay? Thank you, Vanna. Okay, so that's why I was fighting against you. The more spin it has, the more angular momentum. This is conservation of angular momentum, but we also call it rotational stability. So just in case you saw this question on a test, rotational stability and conservation of angular momentum, or co rotational stability is conservation of angular momentum. So if you said something about riding a bicycle and why it's easier, it's because of conservation of angular momentum and rotational stability, because they're both the same answer for this one. Okay? That's why it's easier to ride a bike when you're moving. Remember when your parents first taught you how to ride a bike without training wheels, and they held the back of the wheel, and they got you going, or the back of the seat, they got you going, and then next thing you know, you realize they weren't holding on anymore, and you were riding along by yourself, and then you crashed into a fence and scraped up your face, and yeah, that too. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's not a mental thing. It's not that it's easier to ride a bike just because once you're moving, you, you don't think about it. It's conservation of angular momentum. It's what we just showed. When something's spinning, it wants to stay upright. It wants to keep pointing the same direction. So that's why your parents could get you going, and all of a sudden it was a lot easier to balance on your bike. Okay, because once you're moving here, it's easy to move back and forth. Here is going to fight against me. Okay? Conservation of angular momentum. Now, that's also why quarterbacks have to make sure they throw a football with a spiral. If I throw the football without a spiral, if I just throw in this direction, as it goes to the air, there's wind that's going to blow it around, flop around like a dead duck. Okay? <laughs> So what they tell you, what, that's why quarterbacks will always t have to throw with a spiral. When they throw it, if, it's, if it has a spiral to it, it's spinning, it has angular momentum. And you can even see on a windy day where the ball might kind of move a little bit from the wind, but it will correct itself and stay pointing in the same direction. Conservation of angular momentum. Okay? Um, now, what's the difference between a rifle and a shotgun? Uh, the, besides the pellets, but if, even if there's a slug in the shotgun, the rifle has rifling in the barrel, which means there's a spiral. And then when the bullet travels through the barrel of a rifle, it spins, just like the football, okay? Just like the bicycle wheel. When it's spinning, it's going to keep pointing the same direction. So when the bullet flies through the air, 
it's going to be always more accurate with a rifle. It's going to have a better range and be more accurate because it's spinning. The bullet is spinning as it travels through the air. Where the shotgun, most shotguns don't have any rifling, therefore it can't go a long distance. Okay? All right, last thing. Whoop. Uh oh. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Um, no, almost there. I thought it was doing it by itself. Yeah. No, I can't. Wait for it. Here, pause for me for a second. Gyroscopes. If you've seen gyroscopes, that's the same exact idea. That's what gyroscopes are for. With a gyroscope in, um, a gyroscope is something that they'll use for navigation for uh, astronauts have to use them, uh, pilots have to use them, and the idea is they have something spinning that keeps pointing in the same direction. Okay, with um, with an astronaut, if you're if they're out in space, you can't use a compass. Okay, a compass isn't very useful if that's north and that's south. Does that make sense? The north pole's here, the south pole's there on a planet because you're outside the planet. Get it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So they need a gyroscope. They need something else to keep their direction. With a pilot, same idea, when they need to know the horizon, they have a gyroscope. So if they start flying upward, they see the bottom of the gyroscope, they know they're going up, they're pointing upward. If they see the top of it, they know they're pointing down. Okay, so if they're flying at night and they can't see the horizon, or they can't see the ground below, they need a gyroscope to make sure they know that they're staying level. That's what gyroscope will do. Gyroscopes are also used for um, torpedoes. There was a guy that volunteered um, when I first started teaching that during, war, during World War II, he was given a specific job about if the gyroscopes break when a torpedo is fired. And here's a story. Uh, about 15 years ago, they found a Nazi sub off the coast of New Jersey. No one knew why, why it was there. It, was, it, it had sunk. There was a big, huge, gaping hole on the side of the sub. So if there was a big, huge, gaping hole, you would think the Americans would have any memory of sinking it. They had no record of there even being a Nazi sub off the coast of New Jersey. The Germans had no record of it either. And somehow the communication had gotten lost, and the, and the Nazi sub had headed towards the U.S., and they had to investigate how it sunk. Who shot it down if nobody knew? And what they found out was this. It was already known that if a torpedo was fired and the gyroscope inside of the torpedo broke, the torpedo would do a complete circle. So what happened was the Nazi sub had fired a torpedo at something. The torpedo, the gyroscope had broken and it came back around and hit him dead on the side. Okay, and so back to my, the volunteer, the, the guy that was teaching women that would help out. They had to figure out, they knew about this, and so for the Americans, we had to figure out a way to, or what was the best plan of attack, what was the best thing to do if their torpedo gyro had broken. And so what they realized, you know, because they thought, should they try to go up? Should they try to go down? Should they try to fire the propellers and try to get out of there? And it's this huge thing, and it wasn't fast enough to get out of the way of a torpedo. So their best bet, their safest thing they could do was to turn the sub head on towards the torpedo. Because it was too slow to move up and down and move out of the way, they had their best chance when that torpedo was coming to move head on so there was the smallest area for it to try to hit. And so there was a better chance of missing then with the area than trying to do anything else. And it still hit up? Well, no, well, I mean, I don't know what the, the Nazis, if they knew about it or if they had that plan, but um, that's just what happened with that. So, okay. All right. I'm going to let you copy down Torque and we'll pause here for a second. Torque! Torque is force times radius. Now, again, we're essentially just slapping a radius of something we've already learned. With torque, if you kind of generally think that force was to get something going, then torque is to get something rotating. Okay? So it's not just how much force you apply now, but how far away you are from the axis of rotation. Mm -hmm. If I push on the wheel dead on right here, 
it's not going to rotate. But if I push that with that same force at the end with a radius, it's going to rotate. Okay, so torque is force times radius. Okay, um, I do say force perpendicular, and you might have a problem where we really want to talk about the perpendicular force. If this is perpendicular here, that's only the only amount of force that you'll actually use. And we'll talk about using sine or cosine. But with a door, if I'm going to open this door, make sure there's no one behind it. If I push here with as much force as I want, it's going to be pretty hard to open the door. Because the distance from the, the hinge, distance from the axis of rotation, is almost zero. If I push with that same exact force here, it's going to fly out. <coughs> so it's not just how much force you apply to get something rotating, but also the distance from the axis of rotation. Okay? So it's force times radius. Back in, I know in Williamsburg, I remember here, listening to a tour and they talked about how they wanted everything symmetrical back then. So they would have doorknobs in the center of the door because they thought it looked better. Of course, if you have a doorknob in the center of the door, you have only half the torque than you would here. Okay? Now, again, I said it's F perpendicular. So if I apply a force like this, the only useful part of the force is the part that's going to be perpendicular. Okay? So you're thinking now about Sokotoa kind of stuff. So if I'm pushing with that same force here, it's going to open a lot more than if I apply that force at an angle. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the usefulness with torque. Oh, real quick, units are newton meters. Force times radius, so it's newton times meters. All right. With torque. First off, if you want to be really nice, okay, let's say you're walking through the airport with your mom. Say, you know what, let me carry a suitcase for you. And you carry both suitcases, okay? For one, it's nice and maybe they'll, you know, buy you a pack of gum or something. But on top of that, it's actually gonna be easier on you. When you walk and carry a suitcase, you're gonna have torque right here. Here's my axis of rotation right now. And I have weight pulling me down, there's a torque. And so if you have to walk through an airport for a long distance, your back's going to hurt because your back has to fight to keep you upright. If you have a second suitcase, the second suitcase will offset the other one and the torques will equal out. And yeah, you have a little bit of weight on your arms, but there won't be any torque. And it'll be a lot easier for you to walk through the airport with two, two suitcases than just one where your, where your back has to fight, it, fight uh, against it. What if one says? One's, now, and that's a good question. If one is heavier, what you'll notice is that when you walk through the airport and one is, is heavier, you're actually going to, you do this automatically, you have the lighter suitcase a little bit further out. Okay? And that is because you're increasing the radius. You want to push this one out so that the torques still cancel each other out. Um, okay, so chivalry versus practicality. It makes you look good, but really, you're making your life easier too. Okay, with a torque wrench, they want to measure how much torque is on a bolt because if you put too much torque on it, you can strip the bolt. So they have something called a torque wrench, okay, that measures foot pounds, where foot is really the same thing as meters and pounds is the same thing as newtons. All right, um, if you need to loosen a lug nut, let's say you want, you need to change a tire, and you get your wrench out and you can't pull it, you can't move it. Well, people use something called a cheater bar, which all a cheater bar is, you put a pipe around the wrench, and the pipe will be longer, and you can then loosen the lug nut. You'll have more torque. Okay? Yes, ma'am? It's low on battery. It's low on battery. Did it die yet? No. Okay. We'll get the other battery going. Let me pause here real quick, because we, we can't. Okay. Um, anytime you hear, a lot of times with truck commercials, you hear them advertise their torque. And when you're pulling a heavy load, the torque being applied to turn the wheel is important to move the, to pull that heavy load. But really, the torque is calculated by the engine. Okay? With a car, what happens in any car is that you have a piston moving up and down. Okay? 
and that piston is a plot is is going to move up and down and it's attached to a crankshaft okay so the crankshaft spins it goes down to your car it spins and turns the axles of your car okay that's how a car works now if you have the, so the crankshaft's there and so the piston moves up and down and it spins the crankshaft and goes down to turn your axle depending on how far away the piston is from the crankshaft will tell you how much torque it is in a sports car they don't really need a lot of torque because once they're moving they're going fast so torque isn't as important if you have a truck what you might want to do is most trucks will have want to have more torque to pull those heavy loads so they will have their pistons further away from the crankshaft okay so again it's just force times the radius and the further away the crankshaft will be the more torque it'll be what no all right so that's how you hear about torque when they talk about trucks now let's talk about wrestling all right Vanna come on down um, low battery. That one's a little battery? <laughs> okay, here. Here we go. Let's just record as long as we can. Here's the idea with torque. With wrestling, we used to have a regular, we used to have all these other moves. The first move that everyone learns in wrestling to pin somebody is a half Nelson. And with a half Nelson, they always tell you, you come in through the armpit, you grab the neck, and you crank them over. The second thing that everyone learns is how to defend a half Nelson. And to defend a half Nelson, he brings his elbow down and his head up. And I can't get the half Nelson. Okay? So, we, I think, you know, half Nelson. Again, so the idea is that I want to go here, you know, and every middle school coach says, go through the armpit, grab the neck. And all they need to do to defend is drop their elbow down and pick their head up. And I can't get my half Nelson. So what we did was we just improved it. So when we do our half Nelson, instead of going through the armpit where he can drop and defend, look at his axis of rotation. Where's his axis of rotation right now? Shoulder. Okay, go ahead and move your arm up and down. See that? There's the axis of rotation. So if I'm going in the armpit, how much torque do I have? A lot. None. How much radius do I have? None. My hand's right next to his axis of rotation. So instead of going in the armpit, we punch out to the elbow. Okay, now bring your elbow down. It's a lot harder. Okay? Now, the second part is this. If I grab the back of the neck, move your head up and down. Okay? Where's his axis of rotation? <laughs> right at the neck right here. So how much radius do I have right now? None. I have zero torque because my radius is zero. So instead of going at the, ax er, at, at the axis of rotation, I go on the top of the head. <laughs> All right, now defend the half Nelson. It's a lot harder to do. See that? So if I'm here and here, he, cramp, he, he clamps down, I can't do anything. So our guys know when they throw a half Nelson to punch out and get the top of the head. And now he can't defend it. Okay, thank you, Vanna. All flat. Okay, my last thing I want to say about torque is this. Two things with a screwdriver. One, you're never going to see a screwdriver with a handle this skinny. Why not? Because I won't be able to. There's no torque. Your ax here's here's the rotation out. There's no ro there's no axis or there's no radius. <laughs> okay. The handle, the fatter the handle, here's your radius. Okay. The fatter the handle, the greater the radius, the more torque. So now I'm going to have more torque when I turn the screw. The second part about screwdrivers is I always kind of wondered why they would have still have flathead screws when Phillips head seems to be so much better. You know, you can easily get in there and turn it really quickly. Well, the reason is with a Phillips head, you're going to have a lot less of an area. Okay, especially if it's point. Okay, so really the radius of that could be only this much of the screw. So there's very little torque on that. So that's why there's still jobs that really require for you to you use a flathead screw because it's going to have the greatest radius. Okay, you'll notice if you use um, a screw gun, a drill with a Phillips head, you'll go through really fast, but you'll strip a lot of the screws. Okay, 
And of course, if you have to do a lot of, you know, if you have a lot to do, then you're going to still do a Phillips head. But if there's one or two things that really have to be tight, you want to have the most amount of torque on it, which is why you're going to have a flathead screw on. Okay, because this, even even if it doesn't seem like that much, compared to a pointy head Phillips head screwdriver, this could have twice the radius and therefore twice the torque on it. Okay? Okay. That is it.